Good evening and welcome to this uh, webinar series with myself, Charlie Burton. Um, this, uh, this month's uh, webinar is on the probabilities for the rest of 2024. So it's going to be fairly punchy and um, quite fast re in relative terms, So, which is quite nice. So last month's uh, webinar was quite a long one. This one which is going to be, I'm literally going to be throwing data at you, just scr slide after slide of data. So uh, just a little bit of, before we go into any of that, the usual risk disclaimers um, need to be presented. Uh, the disclaimer, the material provided is for information purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. The views, in, uh, information and opinions expressed in the text belong solely to the author, not to the organization committee or any other group or individual uh, or, com or company. Right. OK, uh, let's get into the overview of this month's um, webinar. So we're going to be covering off what 2023 told us about this year, 2024. The importance of breadth thrusts. What's the what are those all about and what's their their relevance here? Why nineteen sixty one, ninety eight, two thousand thirteen, and two thousand nineteen could determine what happens this year. And the probabilities around the US presidential election, along with seasonal patterns going into the end of the year. So that's what we're um, going to be um, going through just over this next probably 20 minutes or so. It's going to be quite quick. Um, I do have something fairly interesting to some of you. That's going to be fairly interesting to some of you. Um, I've teamed up with Tick Mill, of course, on this, and we've come up with uh, a great idea whereby for some traders, if you would like free access to my my trading community i have a, an online trading community doesn't matter where you're based in the world then um i will share that with you at the end of this sort of 20 25 minutes so that's where you can get free access to my community and we'll go through that uh, at the end of this but anyway coming back to the presentation first of all i'm a bull overall so i'm presenting to you the bullish case for 2024 now <laughs> you've got to bear in mind you know the 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 stock market as you know is already up you know, a reasonable amount the s is up what 15 percent so far this year so uh, but i've had these stats for a long time and so we've been working with these stats uh, since the earlier part of this year so let, uh, what i wanted to do is share these stats with you and what how things could work out going into the end of the year, especially with the US presidential election. Okay, so I'm just going to be throwing uh, analysis research after analysis research at you. First one here is looking at, this one's from Carson Research, and this one is looking at last year. So last year, 2023, uh, the S&P did 24% return. Historically, um, what does it mean? So a 20% plus gain. So it did a 24% return last year. Whenever we've seen historically years where there's been a 20 plus percent return in the S&P, more often than not, 80% of the time, um, the following year has been higher. So 2023, there's a great coming into 2024. There's based on, um, on the history going back to 1950, there's greater likelihood, 80% historically likelihood, that the market ends up again having a positive year. Now, one, one, a couple of caveats here. Well, not really caveats, but um, did th this column was talking about? Well, did they did did the S and P do a better return than what it did in this column over here? And most of the time it didn't. It still had a, a, a follow through positive return, eighty percent of the time, but uh, but most of the time it couldn't replicate or beat. You know, forty five percent. It didn't do forty five percent the following year. It did twenty six. So, well, we've got a question mark here coming into twenty twenty four, of course, because we're not seeing it out yet. And as we already know, 
2024 is already up uh 15 percent for the s p so next slide here uh what does 1961 uh, all of these years 1987 nine, uh, 2019 and 1998 what do all these years have in common with this year well historically they all had a q1 first quarter gains of greater than 10 percent much like this year did so the s p is up 15 percent at the moment uh, at the end of the q1 it was up just over 10 percent so historically again the final nine months of the year tends to have uh positive gains going in by the end of the year so it doesn't always that um the the stock market is going to be higher than where it was at that end of that q1 but certainly it favors positive returns still going into the year end what i'm seeing and have seen in the last especially in the last month is a lot of people getting quite bearish towards the stock market and that's fair enough the stock you know um the stock market has to correct at some point it lasted a correction of six and a half percent in april um and what i tend we tend to find is the stocks go up you know people tend to get more bearish because they they're trying naturally to pick a top and of course many of us are aware that when we look at the u.s indices um there's been um there's a bit of a breadth breakdown and what we mean by that if you take the s p 500 stocks the stock index for example the the index has been making new highs but the number of stocks within that index that are making new highs is is diminishing so it's those few fewer relatively fewer stocks the big nvidias and your microsofts and the likes which are driving that stock index whereas there's a lot of individual stocks within it which are not making new highs so that's what we call a breadth uh weakening breadth however weakening breadth doesn't guarantee that the stock market is going to roll over so there's been a lot of chatter about that lately it's not to say that it couldn't do a correction we've had a great run again but it's not a guarantee there was a lot of that talk in 2023 and yet 2023 was a great year so anyway coming back to this year uh when the q1 is greater than 10 percent, the odds favor 90 percent probability that the stock market still ends up positive by the end of the year so let's move over now to this breadth thrust and so this is um the breadth thrust was created by a chap called my marty zweig um this is courtesy of ned, ned davis research and marty zweig um isn't alive anymore but he was a stock market analyst and a stock investor himself and he created this breadth thrust and so what is a breadth thrust well we, we can see all of these signals of when there's been uh, these green diamonds of when we when the stock markets have had breadth thrusts historically <clears throat> and the 12 month return if we look at the 12 month return here um has 100% of the time whenever we've seen a marty zweig breadth thrust breadth thrust 12 months later there has been um uh, stocks have been higher with an average gain of 23 percent okay so what is a, a marty's way uh breadth uh breadth thrust well it's when the 10-day exponential moving average of the new york stock stock ex, uh, stock exchange advances divided by the uh, the advances plus declines moves from 0 0.4 on it on it on this uh calculation to above 0.61 within 10 days don't worry too much about the, the but that's the calculation so and when that happens um it creates a breadth thrust and historically whenever we've had a breadth thrust 12 months later there's been positive returns so if i go to the next slide here um this gives us all the way back to 1945 when we have had these breadth thrusts and the the interesting thing was that we actually had two last year in 2023 one was in march 
Um, now we've obviously gone past the 12 month, uh, part from March of last year. So that's done. And we've had that positive return. Um, we also had one in November here. So we're not 12 months on yet. And I've already put it on. We're 26% up since November of last year. So we're already 26% up. That doesn't mean to say we can't go higher. Look, in 90, in 2009, we had a breadth thrust and we ended up 46% higher, 44% higher here, 32% here. Um, so admittedly, we've already had quite a run. Um, but nevertheless, um, what that's telling us is that 12 months on from November of last year, we should be higher. Obviously, we already are higher. We're 26%. It'll be interesting to see where we are. But all of these things favor the stock markets not crashing into the end of this year. It's not to say that we couldn't have some pullbacks, but they shouldn't be crashing down and, you know, and um, and going into a bear market. And we're going to present some information on that as well. So all of this at the moment still favors, you know, a positive year for this year. And so... Again, another one. Uh, first 50 days of the year, what does it mean for the rest of the year? Well, 96% of the time, if the first 50 days return is greater than 5% on the S&P, then uh, again, uh, the end of the year as an average return. And that's giving all of these, including 1987, when it was actually a negative year, um, it gives an average return of 12%. So... Um, Again, the stats favor stock market closing out the end of the year, positive, not negative. Now, this chart here I wanted to share because uh, this is an interesting one. What I want you to look at is the S&P return uh, uh, columns here. So we've got the, the negative years, but I want you to have a look at the positive years here. So when... The histogram is positive. So when all of these positive histograms are positive years for the S&P going back to 1980. All right. Now, even within those positive years, you look at the, the, the gold diamonds here. That shows us what the, uh, the maximum pullback was during that year. So as you can see, even in some really stellar years, like in 1980, it actually had a 17% pullback within the year. And so we can check, we can pick off a, a, a number of very positive years here, 16% pullback, and so on and so forth. Most positive years tend to have pullbacks of up to 10%. But there are these years, like this one here, uh, this was in, what, 2003, not surprising there, coming off the bear market, massive up year, and yet its pullback during the year was maximum drawdown pullback was 14%. So what I'm trying to show you here is that even in these positive years, stocks do have some half-decent pullbacks. Um, so within all of that, so... You know, just give painting a picture here for you again that even and we we've already had a six and a half percent pullback for the s p so far this year into april but um but it's not to say that we couldn't have a larger pullback at some point um and yet we still end out the year positive so that's my point there Now, here's one, uh, again, for the bears. <laughs> so, for the bears, there's been a lot of talk about um, when the Fed when the Fed first cut interest rates, whenever that may be, okay? And um, there's a fair bit of chat around, well, when the Fed f cut interest rates is because the U.S. is going, the economy is going into recession and, um, and therefore stocks are going to decline. Well, actually, um, there are, you know, plenty of occasions when after the first Fed cut, there, there is no recession. And the green line on this chart 
shows those instances where well, there was no recession. Fed cut rates, there was no recession, and stock markets continued going higher. And what's interesting on this chart, if we take the zero line here, is three months later. So three months later, or um, here, that we can see that stocks are higher. And even when stocks go into a bear market, I've got some other uh, data in a second, um, after the first Fed cut, stocks still went higher first. So even if we are going to go into a bear market at some point. And um, here's another one. I don't know where, I can't remember where I got this one from, but uh, there've been nine Fed cuts, rate cuts, starting a rate cut cycle uh, that started you know, since 1985, where a Fed cut has started a rate cut cycle. So not just a standalone cut, there's been more. Um, and if we look at the S&P performance during these periods, then the US equity market tends to rise in the subsequent three months following a rate cut cycle. So again, it's just another warning to you that, well, don't get too bearish, because I know that some people uh, are a bit bearish on, well, if we get a rate cut, then stocks are going to start rolling over. Well, the first three months, at least, that's if we don't go into recession. If we don't go into recession, we carry on going higher. But even if we go into recession, well, stocks tend to benefit from that initial rate cut. And in fact, uh, the average S&P gain during those three months following the initial Fed rate cut is 5.1%, which is significantly above the normal three-month S&P return, which is in the 2 to 2.5% two range. So again, just a little bit of a heads up for anyone who is bearish um, on things like a rate cut or when a, um, you know, a, a, an even, you know, the fact that, you know, we've got some breadth divergences, whatever it might be. If you're bearish, that's fine. Um, but don't get too bearish just yet because 2024 statistically, uh, based on historicals still looks like it should be a positive year. Now here's one for the bears. And again, for those of you who are looking for that big, you know, trade be like 2022 when we're in a bear market, um this is interesting here from bank of america and so what they're saying is that 81 percent of losses happen during the actual recession and not in the six months prior so that's a fascinating one because a lot of traders feel like they need to try and catch the top um you know long before a recession happens but 81 percent of the losses in a bear market happen once the economy's actually entered recession. What, we're, what I'm essentially saying is here, there's plenty of time. You don't have to catch a top. You can let the market roll over. And once it goes into a proper rollover, you, there's still um, plenty of time to uh, short the market if that sort of thing was to happen. So statistically... There's plenty of meat on the bone, even once uh, the recession's gone, uh, started. Okay, another one here. Um, make sure I've not... Yeah, okay. So um, let's now move over. So this is from uh, Bank of America, again, from their equity quant strategy team. And again, this is now talking about um, election years. So again, for this year... It looks pretty positive, statistically speaking. So um, the S&P has had positive returns 83% of the time in election years. And it gives us the um, <clears throat> the returns. The irony is we've had uh, that big negative return in 2008 for obvious reasons during the financial crisis. So it's not 100% of the time, but again, the probabilities lie um, with um, the across all of these stats that I'm presenting here today. They still lie with the stock market um, closing out the year positively. So again, more research here. Um, now this is an interesting one. So when the S and P has strong rest of the year uh, returns in a presidential election year, when the index had a 
a positive return in the first 100 trading days. So it's just another uh, different presentation of what I've just said. So st historically, presidential election years uh, are tend to be good for stocks. Not 100% of the time, but 80% of the time. And again, um, if we also have a positive return in that first 100 day trading days, which brings us back to the earlier slide where I said, well, look, in the first 50 days of this year, in 2024, we were greater than 5% up in the S&P. Well, that tells us that we should continue to have a positive return for the rest of the year, into the rest of the year, into the end of the year. So again, it's just a, another variation here. Presidential election year plus a, in, after the first 100 uh, trading days, it's, uh, they, uh, stocks are positive at that point. Well, with a 93% uh, probability, like we've had this year, uh, then historically 93% of the time, stocks have closed positively. So again, I'm just presenting, I'm presenting the bullish case uh, for the markets. You may have a different view, but there's lots of um, stats here. So let's have a look at the cycles here for this year. So, and I'm really punching through these slides here. I appreciate that tonight, but it's quite a nice, easy flowing presentation here tonight. Last uh, last month, it was you know it was full on. There was a lot to go through. Plus, we have to make sure that we are we're done before the top of the hour. So, <clears throat> uh, and one thing I know people are still coming in. Um, I've got a something to show you at the end of. Uh, this presentation um, in conjunction with tick mill uh, we are making my trading community available for free to certain traders around the world so i'll talk about that at the end anyway so another stat here or uh, we'll say a stat this is the the historically this is the seasonal pattern that on average that we've seen from 1950 to current so this is an average of what the S&P has done during an election year over the last, what, 74 years. So some weakness, you know, and chop earlier in the year, which well, we didn't really have too much of that early, but we did remember um, have a pullback in April. So it's not meant to be exact. Every year is going to be slightly different, but this is the the general sort of template. So then we historically across though all of the election years within that 74 year period tend to have a summer rally taking us into a peak in august or september and then a pullback through september and into october time ahead of the presidential election um, and then a rally like a santa claus rally taking us into the end of the year so that's the the general pattern here, the seasonal pattern over the last 74 years when there has been election years. And it sort of makes sense. So is we, the markets are fickle things. And at the moment, they've not been concentrating on the upcoming election too much. But of course, as we start getting into the thick end of the summer, uh, yes, uh, Johan, as we start getting into the thick end of the summer, um, you know, the markets are going to start looking out to that November election as things start heating up towards that. And, you know, the markets, do markets don't like uncertainty. So it wouldn't be surprising to see some form of pullback in that sort of September, October period. It's not a guarantee. This is an average over those 74 years. I'm sure some years it didn't do it. But um, but if we did, if we did see a pullback during that period, um, then the probabilities historically suggest that once we get past the election, that there should be some form of then rally going into the end of the year. Now, here's an interesting, this next slide um might fit really quite nicely with this pattern because last year in 2023 some of you all remember that 
uh, the stock market, we topped out in what August and pulled back August, September and pulled back into October. And so this shows us that when January to, lo- to July is greater than 10%. Well, last year uh, we were fabulously higher. I think we were up about 19% into July. And then if August and September is negative, and this is all go- going back to 1950, then um, the odds of an October or historically what happens is October to December, that final quarter is positive. Every single instance between 1950, when this has happened, so when the first half of the year basically has been greater than 10%, much like exactly what happened last year, and then you see an August, September, which is negative, then the final quarter should end up positive as we can see in all of these instances here historically so okay and then that happened again last year in 2023 so that gets a tick because we had that mighty rally in the in the last quarter last year so let me just take this screen back so if we were to see the stock market top out in let's say august or so and do a bit of a pullback which it could do this year in this election year then uh, those stats could come back into play again for 2024 if we had a negative august september and going into october then historically it favors an october to december rally okay and that sits quite nicely with the historical chart here okay right um those are all of my stats i said we'll probably have this done in 25 minutes um so to summarize the stats favor a positive return by the end of this year for those looking for another bear market we rarely see uh a a bear market just two years after the end of the last one the end of the last bear market was in 2022 it's such a rarity that you will ever see an, another bear market happen so soon so for those of you who are looking for a bear market well you know you've got to be a little bit careful that it's probably a little bit early at the moment for a ma- for another major bear market when the fed cuts rates it doesn't mean necessarily that stocks are going to fall Now, if the economy starts to enter a recession, then yes, they will. And if it does enter a recession at some point, 80% of the the fall in stocks happens once the economy is in recession. So you don't have to race into it, even if, even, you know, you don't have to try and pick the top at all. But for the long term, as I always say, it pays to be cautiously optimistic stocks as we know over the long term spend more of their time going up than down and when they are pulling back it's usually a good tar- it's a good opportunity to look for um levels where you might want to uh be accumulating so there you go so there's a load of stats i've thrown at you i know in the space of 20 25 minutes no half an hour here tonight uh but hopefully it's giving you some food for thought um that that whatever way i slice it there's the the historicals favor a positive year especially with this being an election year okay so what i'm going to do now is obviously we can have a q and a i don't have to we don't have to stop yet we would we rarely do we normally we go on for about two hours <laughs> but we can't tonight so um we will go we will i'll take any questions you like on anything but what i will do because we've only just set this up literally we set this up today and oi yeah pretty much let's have a look here uh, let's see if i can so in lot in um conjunction with tick mill um what we're doing is anyone who opens and this is international so this is outside of the uk sorry outside of the uk um let me just double check if it's outside of europe as 
well um, non-eu sorry anyone who's in the eu or uk i don't think this can apply to but nevertheless um if you come to tickmill.com forward slash lp forward slash charlie hyphen burton i'll just take that link and i'll pop it into the box here so let's just do that into the chat box so uh for those of you who are international um all you have to do is open an account with tick mill you can have a look for all the information there and we will then give you access to my trading community which gives you all of my uh my strategies but also access to my trading room where i'm with my traders every day of the week five days of the week doing training sessions and trading sessions five days of the week so um there you go um all you need to do is take that link and open an account obviously there's some caveats i think the minimum is five thousand dollars to open of course tick mill you know, it costs 123 pound a month to be a part of a member of my community so in order to essentially pay for that uh, tick mill need people to op ha open up an account of a minimum of five thousand dollars and i think they need to do what's this four lots a month so not a lot but um but yeah there you go um little um brucey bonus at the end of today's session right um any questions on anything i've covered here tonight or anything else because we've gone through that really nice and um in a nice fast succinct session uh, 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 manner here this evening as we've gone through um all of those stats but hopefully it's been of use but i'll just uh, see if we get any questions come through could be on any topic trading wise or no no i can see there's no, there's plenty of people in um uh, uh, these are a bit fewer than usual it's about uh 70 people in at the moment so but it's a bit less than usual maybe it's because of the european football championships johan <laughs> but yes there's the people are less chatty yes you're right <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah let's bring up the charts okay so um bitcoin and uh, the question is any tesla and bitcoin targets for this year um yet yeah, uh, tonight was yeah i was throwing a lot of stats at you quite quickly i appreciate that is this recorded mohammed uh yes it is this is being recorded you will be able to get the recording from tick mill um where was i uh, tesla and bitcoin okay i see the uh, the stock markets are down actually they're selling off a little bit here the nasdaq and the s p what's interesting before i come out onto those what's interesting with the s p selling off here today and the nasdaq selling off a lot more is so that's a lovely bar it's like a key reversal bar as we um uh, as we're looking at it at the moment um but what's interesting is actually the the dow jones itself is having an update so that sort of smells to me of probably a bit of uh, sector rotation going on the nasdaq's uh off a bit so uh, tech stocks some of those tech stocks are being sold but we've got Dow component stocks which are being bought. So it's not universal is what I'm saying um, here today from what I'm seeing here. And obviously we still have two and a half hours until the, the market close. Anyway, I digress. Bitcoin, let's go to that one first of all. Um, Bitcoin, as you know, is a lot of the time um, influenced by the stock market. If we're in a risk-off environment, then Bitcoin can um, can come off um but realistically i'm going to come over to a daily chart here of bitcoin i'll take my i've got all sorts of channels on here old historic channels and all sorts which i probably could take off at some point but um you're asking me um uh, what's the question again um <laughs> yeah targets for this year as far as bitcoin um overall i would quite like 
to see Bitcoin get into the 90,000s to 100,000. That's what I would like to see at some point, late, maybe later this year or whatever. So Bitcoin broke to new highs, uh, new historic highs, of course, this year. And overall, at the moment, looking at this uh, weekly time frame, it's just consolidating. Yeah, it's pulling back today and whatever and this week. But overall, the main point is Bitcoin is in a major bull market at the moment and it's just consolidating and that's what it does so overall i have um i'm looking for you know um higher levels for bitcoin but i think the, th the thing with bitcoin is you have to be careful some traders obviously trade it with leverage which is uh can be dangerous um i'm of the attitude of just you know speculating in it and uh, with money you can afford to speculate with and that's what I do with it. And it just set, sits there on the side and I accumulate as we go forward. Almost well, actually every week um, is what I is what I do with that with um, speculative capital. Uh, moving over to uh, Tesla. Yeah, Tesla is an interesting chart. So if I um, come to Tesla here, if I come to my weekly chart here of Tesla, I think this is quite a, uh, an interesting chart because of this trend line, this declining trend line here. So it's been capping prices, as we can see, during this um, move since it made those highs in late 21. But when we get lots, multiple tests of a trend line, I'm usually then looking uh, for price to come back up and test it again at some point. So for me, um, I would like, to see bitcoin get back to that trend line which is up comfortably above 200 dollars. so that's what i would like to see bitcoin do over you know this is a weekly chart so over that sort of medium term over the next two or three months or so is what i would it would be on my wish list yes okay um yeah, that's Tesla. Yeah, I've already covered off Bitcoin. Yeah, um, hopefully. Did I say Tesla when I was still looking at Bitcoin? Sorry, Brian. Um, but yeah, I've covered off Bitcoin and now I've just covered off Bit uh, Tesla. Sorry, I'm, I'm whizzing around. Right, okay. Let's go back here because there's a lot of questions coming through. Um, yes. Uh, no, I... Uh, Vaughn... Hold on a second, make sure... Yeah, Vaughn said, do you consider yourself more of a swing trader these days, Charlie, or a position trader? No more day trading. Yeah, I don't day trade anymore, Vaughn. Um, it would be a very rare thing. It's not that I don't enter positions intraday using intraday charts, but I don't day trade, no. Um, you, I just got to a point several years ago where I needed more time and time to be able to walk out of my office for a couple of hours or even a half a day or whatever. And when you're doing more day trading, if you go and have a day off, you've missed potentially a load of trades. Yeah. And so, whereas when you're positional swing trading, it doesn't really make much difference. So yeah, lifestyle changed and I needed more, more time to be able to do other things. And so, yeah, I don't day trade anymore um what do you think about long term on silver uh yeah silver uh, i'm a long-term bull on silver if i go to the monthly chart here of silver um these are the historical highs from back in 2011 so and what i think is interesting with silver look this is the monthly chart so we've got these lows that occurred multiple lows in 2011 and 12 and all through there that this so this horizontal level became a key level all the way through and then we've just broken out of that level in recent months obviously we've broken out of this trend line as well so what with those breakouts here breakouts above these highs as well this is i see overall for silver um I see it as highly bullish. So um, I've owned physical silver since back in 2018. Um, 
but and I still own that silver. But um, yeah, I, I do. You know, technically, this is you know highly bullish in the bigger picture. What goes on on the day to day, you know, is day to day. But uh, but even actually, if I do go to the daily chart, it's, it's it looks pretty good at the moment. What's just happened is silver's come up, it's pulled back into you know prior prior highs here. 50-day moving average as well, and is mo rotating away from that as we speak. But I'm a I'm a bull anyway, so um, so yeah, so um, a long-term bull there for silver. Oof. Um Which tools or websites can be used to study historical trends and news? Oh God, uh, that that's such an over. I would almost need to do a whole webinar on that, Sammy. So I'll, I'll have to have a think about that and maybe do a webinar on that because um, that's not something I can off the cuff say. Oh yeah, you know. Um, so I'd need to do a webinar on that as far as studying historical trends and all of that and news. So yeah. Uh, when you trade stocks like Tesla, do you take into consideration news developments or only on a technical analysis? Johan, I don't personally. I just got asked about Tesla. I don't trade it. I don't trade actually individual stocks personally. I trade stock indexes and I trade currencies and I will trade some of the commodities such as gold and silver at times as well. So I don't trade them. But you're asking me about that. Should you take into consideration news news developments? Yes, I think you should. Um, you should be aware if you're going to be trading a stock obviously when when the next earnings announcements out but also you need to be aware when other earnings announcements are out with with uh, other stocks within its particular sector group i think you need to have taken a lot of information you don't have to you can just trade technically but if it was me i would want to have i would want to be taking that into consideration as well johan yep I'm conscious of time here uh Ronet, uh, Rone, Ronerwa, um, found you on YouTube in February and literally watched all of your YouTube videos. Well done to you. That's good. Um, <laughs> uh, from your first upload, you elevated my trading business. Okay. And I appreciate your professional advices. That's very kind of you. Um, and I apologize for not being able to pronounce your name. Will gold reach 23,000? Ooh. Um, well, let's go to gold because um, it's at 2,000 at the moment. Um, that's quite a bold call, Anthony. So I, I that's beyond me. But while we've got gold up, um, one thing with, again, coming out to the bigger picture, monthly chart, we've got a big technical analysis, cup and handle in play here. We've broken that cup and handle. If we take the lows of the cup to across the highs of the cup and you take that as a projection that's what you do in technical analysis and you apply that to the high then it gives a projection up around about 2700 800 or so um but 23000 i'll leave that to someone else because that's um yeah completely different in terms of gold what do you think uh what do you think there is a lot of geopolitical tension and the Fed. Um, yeah, well, what's been going on this year with gold um, is there's been a lot of central bank globally uh, buying of gold. So that's what's been, you know, helping and being supportive of gold. I think a lot of central banks have realized they should have more of it. And that's that that theme has continued throughout this year and, and right into to now. So. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't I don't. I think we're in a, a major bull market uh, for gold. Um, I was trading it in the early 2000s, and that, that bull market run ran for the best part of the decade. Um, and I don't see any major long-term euphoria in gold. Like back in here, back in 2011, I was talking to some traders. I'll tell you a story here. And I was doing a webinar, much like tonight, and I was talking to some traders... <laughs> And um, you imagine, you know, gold's been on this long-term tear. Let me just put this into replay mode and just put it there. It was about here. And it's been this huge bull market. All of those, 
you know, for all of those years. So traders became accustomed to gold going up and thought that gold was going to go to $5,000 at that time. And uh, and it was after this red, red bar, this sell-off bar, which was like a key reversal type bar in gold and those other things. And the thing was what was what had been going on with gold is here in the UK, we had all these gold kiosks opening up in high streets, selling, you know, buying gold for cash and all of this stuff. The euphoria was just ridiculous. And to to, to top it off, I was doing this webinar and I so I was saying in this webinar why I thought that gold had probably topped for the foreseeable future. And the abuse that I got <laughs> um, on the back of it saying, no, Charlie, you're wrong. The you know gold's going to go to $5,000 and all this. And, and I said, look, the very fact that you're all, you're all disagreeing and thinking that gold's going to continue going up, even though I've presented all this information to you, um, it, it cements my view. So I went out and sold some more. <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, so, um, gold, uh, ended up coming, um, and let me just get rid of that. As you can see, went into a bear market itself. So essentially for, for quite a bear run or whatever you want to call it for, for quite some time. But I think we're in a, you know, we're in a, uh, a significant bull market. This is my view. This is not the view of anyone else. This is just my views. Um, take them for what you will and um but i do think that we are still in a strong bull market there will be pullbacks of course within this i would love within this overall run that gold's in at the moment i would love to see it get up to that 2700 2800 level before we see the next you know larger correction there will be small corrections when we look at the daily charts be like what's been going on um but in the big picture, that's what I would like to see from that technical analysis uh, projection there. I can see I've got, just so you know, there's 23 men uh, messages lined up for me. And I know that I have to get this webinar stopped in about the next seven minutes. So apologies if I don't get to all your questions. Come on to my YouTube channel and uh, just fire some questions on there and i can i'll always see those and can always come back to you um, um i'm trying to work my way through so um i've covered off a bit on gold so i won't do anything um on gold uh michael um if dollar strength continues and dollar yen continues going up can euro dollar and um and dollar pound dollar still go up yeah so Okay, so yes, yeah, an interesting we're in an interesting point here um, with regards to uh, the lights of the pound dollar and the euro dollar. Pound sold off a bit today after the Bank of England. If I put this onto a weekly chart, it shows us where that's a bit better uh, where the pound is. And so, if the dollar strength continues, the question is: um, Well, if dollar strength continues, then the pound dollar will go down. But I think you mean if dollar strength overall maybe uh, against maybe against the yen as you're saying um i've looked historically at when stock markets fall because usually when stock markets fall the dollar gains um but not always there are there are historically there are periods where stock markets uh, fall but the dollar falls as well so i can certainly answer that but yeah, I mean, um, if the dollar's rising, then of course the euro dollar will go down and the pound dollar will go down. But um, uh, so it's one to watch out for. If the stock market had a larger fall, then normally that uh, that favors uh, the dollar. Actually, my opinion on the euro dollar, Mohammed. Uh, overall, it, I mean, the euro dollar this year's into 2023 has you know been choppy but the 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 lows of 2022 are still firmly in that was a major major level when the euro dollar came um came down there um 
he peaked here in twenty in twenty twenty three at, at one twelve. the The range for twenty twenty three was something like eight hundred and eighty pips. The average yearly range is about fifteen hundred pips. So it was nearly half its average annual range there last year. So far this year, what how what's the range for the euro? About four hundred and forty pips so far. So whatever happens, there's a they, they, we should see a, a reasonable expansion in its range this year. So coming back to your question, what's my opinion? Well, at the moment, the euro's just fallen a, a, away here, and we've got these geopolitical, we've got these political tensions. What with the French elections coming up, which has really dragged the euro down over this last couple of weeks. So my overall opinion would have been upside um because i'd have been look, looking at all of this and when we get multiple touches of a level oh, this one broke through and then came back uh and over here again normally price will then come back up for it and i taught that pattern several months ago on one of these these webinars so um i would still be looking for that However, um, the euro has got to get through these French elections. So let's see what they do first of all. Um, certainly, there's uh, some fears around that at the moment and the uh, political consequences there. Oof. Uh, uh, look, just so you know, there's 24 mess unread messages I've I can see here. I'm never going to get through them. I do apologize because I've literally got just over a minute or so um because it's not fair tickmill said that um we they, they've got another webinar so they need the software uh do i think the bitcoin could retrace to fifty thousand in the short term yeah yeah of course it's a volatile market of course it could do uh when you back test your strategy how many years do you back test and how large a sample size trade data do you back test um uh, Depending on the when you say how many years, depending on the time frame of the of what you're back testing. So, if you're back testing a daily time frame, preferably sort of five years plus. But again, it depends on how many tests I've got. So, um, I want to see you know in excess of a hundred um, historical tests. In excess of that, the more the better. So, hundred, two hundred, three hundred, the more the better. So it depends if you if you're back testing a you know an intraday strategy you might only need to go back a year or two so it does depend and i'm gonna have to leave it on that i'm so sorry that we can't cover off more of these questions tonight but we will be back next month in july july 18th thursday the 18th of july we'll be back so apologies to all of the questions that uh, and comments that um are there this evening i'm so sorry but uh, unfortunately, we do. It's a short and sweet one tonight. I know normally we go on for a lot longer. But do check out the uh, the offer there as well. If you fancy joining me in my community and you can ask me all these questions, all you got to do is um, have open an account with Tickmill if you haven't already. Um, find you outside the UK. All the rule, all of that stuff is in there. So it's tickmill.com forward slash LP forward slash Charlie hyphen Burton and um yeah check it out and um if not i will see you either um like I, like someone's mentioned on my youtube channel at some point um i'm in there twice a week um doing videos and um or back here on the 18th of july in one month's time